up, guys? I'm Justin Burkholz. Thank you for watching. If you saw my video at the beginning of the year, you know I promised to dive into some controversial topics this year, so let's get into it. Today's video is all about witchcraft. Yep, <laughs> witchcraft, starting off with a bang. So if that word causes you to have a strong emotional reaction, you're not alone. This is one of the most misunderstood topics in human history. Now, as you can tell, uh, by my bookshelf here, I've been studying and practicing and reading about witchcraft for quite a few years now, and I feel like it's really important to cut through all the noise and just show people what it is and what it isn't, because there's just so much prejudice when it comes to this topic. For today, I mostly want to cover the actual practices, the craft, so that you can see and know for yourself what witchcraft actually is. Because chances are that everything you've heard about it is total nonsense and probably just anti-witch prejudice. That very same prejudice that has continued uh, from all the way from antiquity to today uh, and is rooted in medieval anti-Semitism and by all accounts is far more damaging and dangerous than any witch has ever been. It did result in the torture and murder of tens of thousands of women. And that's something we should not ever forget. So that brings me back to why I want to cover these controversial topics in the first place. It's because misunderstanding and ignorance around them has already resulted in so much suffering. I really don't want that to continue. And if we don't learn from our mistakes, we absolutely will repeat them. Like I said, anti-witch prejudice is just so pervasive. It's lasted for so long. I really think this is something that just needs to be brought out into the light so that people can actually know what they're talking about for once and see that there's not really anything here to fear. At least that's the way that I believe after looking into this for quite a few years myself. Remember that ignorance around... Any topic leaves room for conspiracy theories, and as much as people want to believe that conspiracy theories are harmless, they just simply are not. People die. So, today we're going to take a look at some actual spells, rituals, practices, and beliefs, both from ancient and modern witches, so that you can see them for yourself. And if you're interested in looking into this further, I will have all the books I reference linked in the description below. Sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to ask you real quickly, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please hit that button for me. Really helps me out. I really want to grow as much as possible this year, and I need your help to do so. Thanks. Now let's get back to the episode. Witchcraft has been around forever. Uh, we find evidence of it as far back as we can look. In fact, the oldest known biblical manuscripts, known as KH1 and KH2, or the Kedef Hinnom amulets, or scrolls, are just that. They are magical amulets. Uh, the making of which, as we will see, is one of the most common practices in witchcraft. Uh, these specific artifacts have been described, and I'm quoting here, as one of the most important discoveries ever made, for biblical studies. They provide us with valuable information about the development of the Hebrew alphabet. They preserve the earliest known citations of texts also found in the Hebrew Bible, and the earliest examples of confessional statements concerning Yahweh, the God of the Bible. And we have witches to thank for their existence. As I was making this video, uh, the thought occurred to me to check the book I've been reading to see if it has any relevant uh, information or articles about any of the artifacts or manuscripts that I was looking at, and uh, it does. So <laughs> I just wanted to point this out to you guys real fast. I have this book right now uh, I borrowed from my father called Lost Treasures of the Bible, and it references the uh, Kedef Hinnom scrolls or amulets. And so I just wanted to show you guys this. Um, I'll quickly here. Uh, let's see where it says, 
Yeah, silver scroll amulets, the oldest biblical text ever discovered. So it's not just uh, my opinion or Wikipedia or anything. This is a very scholarly, academic uh, book, and they also repeat this. And so they have some really interesting information here about those amulets, including uh, information on what is actually inscribed on them. So I just want to go over that here with you. So it says, In 1979, while excavating burial caves across the Hinnom Valley from Mount Zion and the old city of Jerusalem, Gabriel Barque discovered one cave that had not been plundered. In Cave 4, he found the bones of nearly 100 people that had been placed there over several centuries. Among the many objects discovered there, more than 100 pieces of jewelry, 250 complete pottery vessels, 40 arrowheads, and numerous incived ivory pieces, he found two small silver scrolls designed to be worn on a cord about the neck. The one pictured here is the smaller of the two. Both contained this portion of the familiar words from the priestly blessing, found in Numbers 6, 24 through 26, which reads, May Yahweh bless and keep you. May Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. This inscription was written in Paleo-Hebrew with cursive lettering by someone who clearly was not a professional scribe. Deciphering the writing on the scrolls was impossible at first because the lettering had been incised so lightly, and the scrolls themselves contained numerous breaks. Translation was at last made possible thanks to modern computer imaging techniques. This research confirmed the archaeologist's original estimate of the date of the scrolls, firmly placing the objects in the late 7th century BC. The discovery of these silver scrolls deserves to be known as one of the most important events in the history of biblical archaeology. The inscription found on them is the oldest quote of a biblical text ever discovered, more than 400 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. To place the amulets in context, when their inscriptions were written, King Josiah of Judah may well have been upon the throne. The discovery of the book of Deuteronomy had recently been celebrated. And a spirit of spiritual renewal was sweeping over the country after the disastrous 55-year reign of the idolatrous King Manasseh. Perhaps the possessor of this scroll was participating in such a renewal by the wearing of this prayer. Obviously, its wearer regarded it as one of his most prized possessions, as it was included with him in burial. In a few short years, assuming the owner died previous to 587 BC, the Babylonians would lay siege to Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry thousands of the citizens of Judea into captivity. In one sense, it is not entirely correct to refer to this inscription as the oldest quotation from the Bible. In fact, it may be even older than that. These scrolls with their inscription predate the formal writing of the biblical book, which contains the quotation the book of Numbers, and thus they belong to the earlier period of oral history and transmission. This priestly benediction was a traditional prayer well known over many centuries. It is still in use in Jewish liturgy today, as well as by parents to bless their children on the Sabbath. Christian churches also use its words as a benediction with which to close their worship. The many strands of tradition in the book of Numbers make this blessing exceedingly difficult to date, but it clearly predates the formal style of the post-exilic period in which its introduction, Numbers 6, 22-23, is written. To find a copy from this early century of a benediction that later would become a much-loved verse in the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Old Testament, is to find a treasure indeed. There is even a reference to the making of this exact type of silver protective amulet recorded in the Bible itself, in Psalms 12, 7 through 9, which reads, The utterance of Yahweh are pure utterances, silver refined in a furnace in the earth, purified seven times. You, O Yahweh, will guard them. 
You will protect him from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl. A vileness is exalted among humankind. So you see there, that's a uh, verse in the Psalms, but it is specifically talking about the creation of magical protective amulets using the utterances of Yahweh to protect the bearer from the wickedness and vileness um, that seems to be on every side of them. And so we actually have copies of these silver amulets going all the way back to the absolute earliest known examples of texts that later became the Hebrew Bible. Now that alone is fascinating uh, and tells you a lot about uh, ancient history. But what's also interesting is that within ancient uh, Judaism, there were other practices that we consider witchcraft today that were explicitly divinely sanctioned. One of those would be a practice that's known as divination. And divination is the use of any kind of object to divine a, uh, a message from God or from a spirit or something like that. Some people believe they're contacting the spirits of their ancestors through divination. Whatever it is, they're using uh, tarot cards or bones or dice or some kind of object, and they're interpreting what happens with that object as a message from the divine, hence the name divination. In the Bible, the specific form of divination that is divinely sanctioned is used by the high priest, and it was the use of some objects that we know as the Urim and Thummim. Now, we don't really know what those objects were. Um, there's no real scholarly consensus, but they might have been some sort of gems or stones or something like that that the high priest actually kept uh, in his breastplate in some sort of pocket or socket or something like that. And these were used for divination. You can see Exodus 28 and 1 Samuel for more info on that. It's interesting to note that within the Bible, it is only foreign forms of divination which are banned according to Deuteronomy 18. And this is important to note because for all of human history, people have been using terms like magic and witchcraft derogatorially to describe foreign religious practices, while their own religious practices, which are often exactly the same, are just accepted parts of their culture and their religion. I do want to make a full video dedicated to the history of witchcraft and Christianity to explore all the ways that misunderstandings, mistranslations, and social pressures have led to the persecution, torture, and mass murder of women accused of being witches, but for now I just wanted to give you some background to show some context for the ancient witchcraft practices that we're going to look at so that you can see that these aren't just pagan practices. They existed within Judaism since time immemorial, and their practice definitely continued into Christianity uh, despite the best efforts of the Catholic Church. If you want to learn more about ancient magic and witchcraft, one of the best source and reference texts to turn to is going to be this book right here, what's known as the PGM, or the Greek Magical Papyri in Translation, by Hans Dieter Betz. It includes translations of 131 papyri from Greco-Roman Egypt, containing a variety of magical spells and formulae, hymns, rituals, uh, and other practices uh, dating from around the 2nd century BC to around the 5th century AD. Here's a quote from the introduction to provide more context into why so few papyri survive to today and why they are so important for us to study. Indeed, the first centuries of the Christian era saw many burnings of books, often of magical books, and not a few burnings that included the magicians themselves. As a result of these acts of suppression, the magicians and their literature went underground. The papyri themselves testified to this by the constantly recurring admonition to keep the books secret. 
yet the systematic destruction of the magical literature over a long period of time resulted in the disappearance of most of the original texts by the end of antiquity. To us in the 20th century, terms such as underground literature and suppressed literature are well-known descriptions of contemporary phenomena. We also know that such literature is extremely important for the understanding of what people are really thinking and doing in a particular time, geographical area, or cultural context. Magical beliefs and practices can hardly be overestimated in their importance for the daily life of the people. The religious beliefs and practices of most people were identical with some form of magic. And the neat distinctions we make today between approved and disapproved forms of religion, calling the former religion and church, and the latter magic and cult, did not exist in antiquity except among a few intellectuals. Thus, the suppression of this magical literature has deprived us of one of our most important sources of ancient religious life. Modern views of Greek and Roman religions have long suffered from certain deformities because they were unconsciously shaped by the only remaining sources, the literature of the cultural elite and the archaeological remains of the official cults of the states and cities." End quote. Now, if you want to learn more about the history of the persecution of witchcraft, I really highly recommend this book here, um, Brian Marescu's phenomenal bestseller, The Immortality Key. Uh, it gives you a lot more information about the context of uh, the time and location in which these ancient um, uh, papyri uh, come from, you know, the first few centuries BC and AD. I highly recommend this one. Pick that up if you want to learn more about that particular side of uh, witchcraft and uh, its persecution by the Catholic Church. Okay, now that we've gone over some of the context uh, for these uh, ancient uh, um, spells and rituals we're going to talk about, I want to actually open up the PGM here and uh, go over a few spells with you, read through them, and I'll put the uh, text up on the screen as well so that you can see what I'm quoting from here, um, because I really want to just show you exactly uh, what was going on and what people were doing, and then you can see for yourself. So okay. I'm going to start out with just a really simple spell here. There is a huge variety within the PGM from spells that are like a couple of lines of text, you know, very simple, to pages and pages of elaborate rituals and prayers and invocations and stuff. There's some really, really cool stuff in here, some really beautiful hymns um, to the gods and, uh, and invocations and stuff. We'll get to some of those later. But for now, I just want to start out with a really simple spell um, and one that is not too different from some of the stuff you would see today. So I'm going to give the reference numbers here for anyone who has a copy of the PGM or anyone who wants to look it up online. Uh, that way you can know exactly what I'm uh, quoting from here. So this is PGM 3, 410 through 423. Now you'll see right away that this also relates back to those biblical manuscripts I mentioned earlier. So quoting here, it says, take a silver tablet and engrave it after the God sets. Uh, quick note, in ancient magic or anywhere in the PGM, if you see the words, the God. Uh, what they mean by that is uh, the sun. Uh, they're talking about Helios and they're talking about the sun. So they're saying after the God sets, after sunset. If they say the goddess, they're talking about the moon and they mean the moon goddess Selene. Um, you'll see this come up quite, quite often in the PGM. So after the... God sets, you engrave your amulet. You also take cow's milk and pour it into a clean vessel. Place the tablet you engraved under that vessel and add into the milk uh, barley meal and mix it to form bread. 
and you're supposed to form 12 roles in the shape of female figures. Now, the shape of female figures, uh, this is most likely uh, like the, uh, the Venus uh, figurines or uh, the mother goddess uh, figures, usually with a, a large belly, uh, exaggerated um, thighs, breasts, that kind of thing. And it was a symbol of fertility. It was an ancient symbol of the divine feminine. Uh, very, very common in the ancient world. So you make 12 rolls in the shape of the female figures, and you say this certain formula uh, three times while you eat the rolls on an empty stomach, and it says, quote, you will know the power. <laughs> so uh, very interesting spell, and it provides a formula here, which I am not going to attempt to pronounce. The words will be on the screen for you. Uh, trust me, you don't want me to, uh, to attempt to stumble through this, uh, but you can have fun if you want to try and pronounce it yourself at home. So after you uh, pronounce that formula while eating the rolls on an empty stomach, it says some more instructions here. So what it says is do this monthly facing the moon on the first day of the month. Prostrate yourself before the goddess and wear the tablet as an amulet. So there we get the reference to the goddess I was talking about. And it provides a little drawing here that I am assuming you are meant to engrave onto that tablet. Uh, I'm assuming that was what you're supposed to engrave because it didn't give you a specific uh, direction there. All right. So yeah, very interesting spell. It's supposed to give you some sort of uh, divine power of, of memory or intellectual power, like I was saying. And it essentially involved creating a silver amulet um, with a specific engraving on it and then making bread out of milk and barley, shaving, shaping that into these female figures, assuming cooking those. It doesn't specify to cook the rolls, but probably want to do that and uh, eat them on an empty stomach while reciting this specific formula. So you can see there, uh, there's nothing scary. There's nothing really demonic or satanic or anything like that about this. It's just kind of an interesting kind of superstitious practice. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at another one. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at a uh, spell that's a little more extensive. And this one is the PGM 4, 3007 through 3086. And at the top it says, this is a tested charm of Pibicus for those possessed by demons. Uh, and the note here at the bottom says that uh, Pibicus, not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, was a legendary magician from Egypt um, known as the Falcon. So it was referring to his authority as being a legendary magician. But the reason that I want to share this specific spell is because this one is uh, an example of very early Christian magic. So it is kind of an exorcism type spell, uh, but it has a lot of um, typical actions and practices like any other witchcraft spell. So at the very beginning, it tells you to take oil of unripe olives with the herb mastigia and the fruit pulp of the lotus and boil them with colorless marjoram. So you're making some kind of potion or tincture here. And you are meant to pronounce this certain formula uh, while doing that. So I'll provide the uh, text on the screen for you once again. And it provides the formula there. And at the end of this formula, there's a couple really interesting notations that I just want to uh, note here really fast. So it provides the formula, and then at the end it says, come out from, and it has two capital N's. Uh, N as in Nancy. Now, anywhere that you see that notation, the two capital N's like that, in the PGM, that's going to be essentially a blank or a placeholder for a name. So since this is an exorcism spell, they're saying a bunch of divine names or 
you know, a magical formula, and then they're saying come out from the person they're trying to exercise the demon from. So you would insert whoever the person's name is uh, into that spot there. And then right after that, it has in parentheses, add the usual. And this is really interesting as well. Apparently, these kinds of magical practices were so common that they didn't even bother writing out the whole spell or the whole invocation or the whole uh, whatever, the whole practice. They would often just say, add the usual at the end. Um, this could be the usual ingredients or it could be the usual praises of the god or usual statements. Um, there were a lot of things that were usual. There's a lot more to the spell. So that was only the very first section. The next section is titled the phylactery, and it gives instructions on how to make a specific phylactery for this specific spell. Now, a phylactery is a magical object that typically has some sort of inscription on it and is worn on the uh, arm or head or uh, around the neck as like an amulet or something. It's a magical object that you um, keep on your person and that you use during a spell or ritual. So for this specific phylactery, the instructions are, on a ten lamella, write, and then it gives a bunch of divine names, I'll put those on the screen for you, and hang it on the patient. Remember, the patient is the one who is possessed by demons who we're trying to help. It says this phylactery is terrifying to every demon, a thing he fears. After placing it on the patient opposite to you, uh, conjure, and then it provides a conjuration. So it says this is the conjuration. And this is where things get really interesting. It says, I conjure you by the God of the Hebrews, Jesus. And then it provides another list of divine names there or a magical formula who appears in fire, who is in the midst of land, snow, and fog. Let your angel, the implacable, descend and let him assign the demon flying around this form, which God formed in his holy paradise, because I pray to the holy God. Calling upon, and it provides another formula here, <clears throat> I conjure you. Another formula, I conjure you by the one who appeared to Israel in a shining pillar and a cloud by day, who saved his people from the Pharaoh and brought upon the Pharaoh the ten plagues because of his disobedience. I conjure you, every demonic spirit, to tell whatever sort you may be, because I conjure you by the seal which Solomon placed on the tongue of Jeremiah, and he told. You also tell whatever sort you may be heavenly or aerial, whether terrestrial or subterranean, or netherworldly, or abusius, or chersius, or pharisius. Tell whatever sort you may be, because I conjure you by God, light-bearing, unconquerable, who knows what is in the heart of every living being, the one who formed of dust the race of humans, the one who, after bringing them out from obscurity, packs together the clouds, waters the earth with rain, and blesses its fruit. The one whom every heavenly power of angels and of archangels praises. I conjure you by the great God Sabaot, through whom the Jordan River drew back, and the Red Sea, which Israel crossed, became impassable. Because I conjure you by the one who introduced the 140 languages, and distributed them by his own command. I conjure you by the one who burned up the stubborn giants with lightning whom the heaven of heavens praises, whom the wings of the cherubim praise. I conjure you by the one who put the mountains around the sea or a wall of sand and commanded the sea not to overflow. The abyss obeyed. And you obey, every demonic spirit, because I conjure you by the one who causes the four winds to move, together from the holy aeons, the sky-like, sea-like, cloud-like, light-bringing, unconquerable one. I conjure you by the one in holy Jerusalem, before whom the unquenchable fire burns for all time, with his holy name. 
the one before whom the fiery Gehenna trembles. Flames surround. Iron bursts asunder, and every mountain is afraid from its foundation. I conjure you, every demonic spirit, by the one who oversees the earth and makes its foundations tremble, the one who made all things which are not into that which is. Okay, so that was a really beautiful and interesting conjuration uh, that once again makes quite a few explicit Christian uh, or Hebraic uh, references, you know, references Jesus himself, the nation of Israel, uh, the plagues brought upon the Pharaoh, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, Solomon. Um, I mean, it goes on and on and on, right? There's so many explicitly Christian references there. Uh, the only way to understand this is as a form of early Christian magic, uh, which isn't too surprising since it is for um, to heal someone who's been possessed by demons, so it's basically an ancient exorcism. So I really like that one because it gives an example of, like I said, specifically Christian magic. It has a re what I think is a really beautiful conjuration. I just think the writing is very interesting. Um, and it's yeah, pretty straightforward. It involves uh, phylactery, which is very common in ancient magic and witchcraft. And it has some of the common tropes of ancient magic as well, like the name placeholder and the add the usual at the end. Um, and it just gives one quick uh, set of instructions at the very end here uh, after that conjuration. This is from the person uh, explaining the spell, right? So it says, And I adjure you, the one who receives this conjuration, not to eat pork. And every spirit and demon, whatever sort it may be, will be subject to you. And while conjuring, blow once blowing air from the tips of the feet up to the face, and it will be assigned. Keep yourself pure, for this charm is Hebraic and is preserved among pure men. All right, and I just want to uh, cover a couple more um, uh, spells or rituals here from the PGM uh, to give you a couple more examples of ancient magic and witchcraft. Um, and these next two examples are specifically initiations. Um, so this is something that was extremely common in the Greco-Roman world. There were all of these uh, what are known as mystery cults or mystery religions. Cult here, not in the modern sense of the word, but in the academic religious studies sense of the word, just meaning a group of people who worship a specific deity or, or whatever. So... Um, there's no negative <laughs> connotation there to the, the Greek Roman mystery cults. Um, but what they were is they had uh, initiations for people who were brought in um, to the uh, tradition, and they would have to go through a certain process, and there would be kind of a dramatic initiatory uh, process. There were also self-initiations that were meant to uh, cause you to have maybe specific realizations, or um, kind of spiritual experiences, supposedly. That was the goal anyways. Um, and they would provide you with a new insight and a new perspective on the world, which is the point of initiation in general. So this first one I'm going to reference is another short spell here. And I really wanted to read this one in particular because... It's going to be more like what people think of when they think of stereotypical witchcraft. Um, and a lot of people think this is like still how people practice today. Um, but it's not. And, and so just to, to give a, a quick note here, uh, the reason I say that is there are some uh, animal parts involved in the uh, ritual and that seems really like barbaric and gross and strange to us today because we aren't used to dealing with like slaughtering animals regularly on a daily basis. But the people who were performing these spells at this time absolutely were. Uh, animal sacrifice for religious purposes was ubiquitous. And even beyond that, if you were to eat meat of any kind, you would have to catch that animal and slaughter it yourself. There weren't grocery stores for people to go to. So people were uh, 
involved in butchering and slaughtering animals of all kinds on a basically daily basis. And so to use a part from an animal or to kill an animal for a spell was absolutely not unusual. It totally fit within the cultural context of the time. So we have the tendency to look at things through modern lens and judge them that way. And I think we need to set that aside when reading these ancient spells. And we're going to look at some modern ones, right? But these ancient spells are from a very different cultural context. And so you need to keep that in mind uh, when they talk about using blood of an animal or the eye of some animal or something like that. Okay, so let's get to this next spell. A lot of the spells in the PGM have labels. Uh, and this one is certainly one of those. So it says at the very beginning that this is an initiation. Once again, for people who want to read along or look this up, this is PGM 4, 26 through 51. It says, Keep yourself pure for seven days beforehand. On the third of the month, go to a place from which the Nile has recently receded, before anyone walks on the area that was flooded or at any rate to a place that has been inundated by the Nile. On two bricks, standing on their sides, build a fire with olive wood. When half of the sun is above the horizon, but before the sun appears, dig a trench around the altar. When the disk of the sun is finally above the horizon, cut off the head of an unblemished solid white cock, or chicken, which you are to carry under your left arm. When you are beheading the cock, fix it in place with your knees and hold it down all by yourself. Throw the head into the river and drink up the blood, draining it off into your right hand and putting what's left of the body on the burning altar. Then jump into the river. Immerse yourself in the clothes you have on. Walk backwards out of the water. And after changing into fresh garments, depart without turning around. After this, take bile from an owl, rub some of it over your eyes with the feather of an ibis, and your initiation will be complete. But if you can't get a hold of an owl, use an ibis's egg and a falcon's feather. Bore a hole in the egg, insert the feather, break it open, and thereby get the fluid to rub on yourself. So you can see here that some people might not have had access to um, an owl, for instance, uh, maybe depending on what part of the Greco-Roman world they lived in, uh, but it seems that in that case, ibis is and falcons were common enough that they would be uh, readily available to anyone who wanted to perform this initiation. Now, this was probably from Egypt, considering it specifically references the Nile and performing this spell on the uh, banks of the Nile. But yes, I think that's a very interesting uh, example of kind of the stereotypical, uh, you know, um, idea of witchcraft that it involves, you know, uh, blood or animals or something like that. And yes, yeah, some ancient witchcraft did. It, it, you know, not all of it, like we saw, there was one where they were just making bread and eating it, uh, but other practices did. But once again, killing and sacrificing an animal for religious purposes was totally normal at this time and in this, you know, area. Uh, so this would not have been unusual to anyone else uh, who, who saw this um, or, you know, heard about it. Okay, now next we're going to take a look at a very different type of initiation from the uh, cult of Mithraism. So this one's really fascinating. This next uh, ritual here is an initiation ritual into the Mithraic mysteries. And the goal of this, as stated in the introduction, which I'm going to read, is to gain immortality. Now, this is really interesting because that sounds really grand and, uh, you know, out there maybe, but uh, gaining immortality had a different meaning in the ancient world than it, than it does today. It wasn't just about uh, living in your physical body uh, forever. And actually, um, 
the immortality key, I guess I didn't put it back on my shelf, uh, talks about this a lot in the book is that the idea of gaining immortality to the ancients was more about going through an initiatory process that provide, uh, provides or affords a sort of mystical experience, a transformative experience that totally changes your perspective on uh, your own soul, on your place in the universe, on God, etc. And what happens is it reveals to you your own immortal nature so that you are aware of the immortal nature of your soul and that you know that you are immortal uh, spiritually. It's not about gaining physical immortality in our physical bodies. Uh, it's not about some secret potion or some philosopher's stone that makes you live forever physically. All of that is, you know, metaphorical and all of that is talking about realizing your own immortality and getting rid of your fear of death. These are two things that people state about all of the ancient uh, mysteries. You know, people who came from the mysteries of Eleusis said this, um, Dionysius, uh, Mithras, etc. It seemed to be a very common practice in the ancient world to have these initiatory practices that sometimes involved uh, psychedelic substances, uh, sometimes it just involved uh, fasting or sleep deprivation or very dramatic rituals of some kind. And the point is to produce a mystical or transformative experience in the people going through the initiation. Okay, so let's take a quick look here uh, at this uh, spell. And this is PGM 4, 475 through 829. There's a little introduction here. And the author says, Be gracious to me, O Providence and Psyche, as I write these mysteries handed down, not for gain, but for instruction. And for an only child, I request immortality. O initiates of this our power, which the great god Helios Mithras ordered to be revealed to me by his archangel, so that I alone may ascend into heaven as an inquirer and behold the universe. It says, furthermore, it is necessary for you, O daughter, to take the juices of herbs and spices, which will be made known to you at the end of my holy treatise. So that's very interesting. Um, he says that uh, you know, the purpose of passing this on is not for his personal gain, but for the instruction and the betterment of the uh, person being initiated. He says that he's requesting immortality for this person and that he is going to instruct them on how to make some sort of potion out of the juices of herbs and spices, which he says he'll make known at the end of this lesson here. Now, there are some references to some herbs and stuff towards the end of this spell, which is interesting. Um, I don't think it actually gives the full formula. He only mentions uh, one or two herbs here at the end. So I'm not sure what exactly that formula was originally, but it could have had some sort of psychedelic or psychoactive properties. So after that... It provides an invocation for the spell, and then he describes what seems to me like a visionary experience, and he describes uh, the visionary experience that you should have if you perform this spell correctly, and if you go through the initiation uh, correctly. And so the next few passages go back and forth from quotes of what you're supposed to say, um, you know, the, the invocation of the person performing this, and then descriptions of what you're supposed to see while going through this experience. So, the invocation starts out, and I'm not going to quote all of this for you. I'm just going to read sections. Um, you can look it up if you want to read the whole thing. So it says, first, origin of my origin First beginning of my beginning, spirit of spirit, the first of spirit in me. 
fire given by God to my mixture of the mixtures in me, the first of the fire in me, water of water, the first of the water in me, earthly material, the first of the earthly material in me, my complete body, I, and there's a name placeholder here, whose mother is, another blank, which was formed by a noble arm and an incorruptible right hand in a world without light and yet radiant, without soul and yet alive with soul. Now, if it be your will, give me over to immortal birth and following that to my underlying nature, so that after the present need which is pressing me exceedingly, I may gaze upon the immortal beginning with the immortal spirit, with the immortal water, with the most steadfast air, that I may be born again in thought, and the sacred spirit may breathe in me, so that I may wonder at the sacred fire, that I may gaze upon the unfathomable, awesome water of the dawn, and the vivifying and encircling aether may hear me, for today I am about to behold with immortal eyes, I born mortal from mortal womb, but transformed by tremendous power in an incorruptible right hand and with immortal spirit, the immortal aeon and master of the fiery diadems. I, sanctified through holy consecrations, while there subsists within me holy for a short time, my human soul might, which I will again receive, after the present bitter and relentless necessity, which is pressing down upon me. I, blank, whose mother is blank, according to the immutable decree of God, and then a formula, since it is impossible for me, born mortal, to rise with the golden brightness of the immortal brilliance, stand, O perishable nature of mortals, and at once receive me safe and sound, after the inexorable and pressing need. So that is the first invocation in this very long and elaborate ritual. Uh, and I just, I like to read that because it, uh, it, I find it so interesting and poetic. The Mithraic hymns and um, initiations and prayers are all very beautifully written. Uh, very interesting. So, the next part of the spell here uh, gives some instructions on what to do at this point in the experience. And you'll notice this a lot in ancient spells. They give specific instructions on breathing, on specific kind of sounds you make. Um, and these are all thought to have magical power uh, in them. So there's some things that I skipped in the invocation where it tells you to make like popping and hissing type noises. There's some divine formulas and names that I've skipped here that I'm not pronouncing. Um, but all of that is a part of the spell, and it was all seen as being very important. And I think what they were doing is they were tapping into the, uh, the effects that uh, breath and uh, vocalizations have on consciousness, and they were working with that in really interesting ways. Um, so these next directions here after that invocation says, draw in breath from the three rays, drawing up three times as much as you can, and you will see yourself being lifted up and ascending to the height so that you seem to be in midair. You will hear nothing either of man or of any other living thing, nor in that hour will you see anything of mortal affairs on earth, but rather you will see all immortal things. For in that day and hour you will see the divine order of the skies, the presiding gods rising into heaven and others setting. Now the course of the visible gods will appear through the disk of God, my Father, and in similar fashion the so-called pipe, the origin of the ministering wind. For you will see it hanging from the sun's disk like a pipe, and you will see the outflow of this object towards the regions westward, boundless as an east wind, if it be assigned to the regions of the east and the other, similarly towards its own regions. And you will see the God staring intently at you and rushing at you. So this is very interesting because what he's describing sounds an awful lot like astral travel or astral projection to me. And this is one of those uh, uh, kind of practices and beliefs that has continued 
from uh, antiquity, from as far back as the Greco-Roman world, to today. There are still a lot of people teaching and practicing astral travel, and it sounds almost exactly like this. You're uh, being lifted up from your body, you're, you're having like a, a disembodied, kind of out-of-body experience, you're not perceiving the physical, normal world around you, but some kind of spiritual or heavenly world, astral world. And he says that you will see the gods in heaven. So this sounds like a vision of heaven or something like a beginning of a mystical experience. And it says you will see the gods staring intently at you and rushing at you. So at once put your finger on your mouth and say, silence, 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 symbol of the living, incorruptible God. Guard me, silence. And this is a motion and a uh, posture and an action that, once again, is still being practiced in modern-day magic and witchcraft. If you look at the practices of the Golden Dawn, this specific sign is still used in their rituals and ceremonial magic today the same meaning. It's the sign of silence, um, and it has more meaning than that to a magician um, about not uh, revealing yourself or not revealing practices to people who aren't ready for them, who aren't initiated, etc. So that uh, motion, that posture, often goes along with initiation rituals. So once you have done that, it tells you to then make a long hissing sound, next a popping sound, and say the following magical formula. Then you will see the gods looking graciously upon you and no longer rushing at you, but rather going about in their own order of affairs. So when you see that the world above is clear and circling and that none of the gods or angels is threatening you, Expect to hear a great crash of thunder so as to shock you. Then say again, silence, silence. I am a star wandering about with you and shining forth out of the deep. Immediately after you have said these things, the sun's disk will be expanded. And after you have said the second prayer, where there is silence, silence, and the accompanying words, Make a hissing sound twice and a popping sound twice, and immediately you will see many five-pronged stars coming forth from the disk and filling all the air. Then say again, silence, silence. And when the disk is open, you will see the fireless circle and the fiery doors shut tight. Once again, this is a really interesting visionary experience that they're describing, and he's giving you specific instructions that you're supposed to do certain actions, say certain things, make certain sounds at specific points in the visionary journey. And this is another uh, practice and, and kind of belief that is continued into today. Uh, there are still forms of magical practice where people uh, kind of astral travel and they supposedly come across certain like gatekeepers or angels or something they have to provide a password or make some kind of sign in order to move forward through the vision so that's exactly what we're seeing here in this mithraic initiation after this point it provides a third prayer um, and i'm not going to read all of this one it's rather long it mostly lists um, names of the divine so a, a bunch of uh, epithets of of the divine it says firewalker uh, light maker, fire breather, light breather, fire delighter, beautiful light, blah, 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 blah. So after all of those divine names, it says, Open for me, because on account of the pressing and bitter and inexorable necessity, I invoke the immortal names, living and honored, which never pass into mortal nature and are not declared in articulate speech by human tongue or mortal speech. Or mortal sound and then it provides such uh, immortal names so I'll have the uh, formula there for you on the screen and he says to say all these things with fire and spirit until completing the first utterance then similarly begin the second 
until you complete the seven immortal gods of the world. When you have said these things, you will hear thundering and shaking in the surrounding realm, and you will likewise feel yourself being agitated. Then say again, say, silence. Then open your eyes, and you will see the doors open and the world of the gods which is within the doors, so that from the pleasure and joy of the sight your spirit runs ahead and ascends. So stand still and at once draw breath from the divine into yourself while you look intently. Then when your soul is restored, say, come Lord, and the divine formula. Okay, so once again, he's provided another prayer and then some more instructions. He's saying to say all these prayers with fire and spirit. And this is a really important point, and one that a lot of people miss when it comes to modern magic and witchcraft. Like I mentioned before, they were playing with the ability of vocalizations and breath and ritual to uh, alter our state of consciousness and to afford transformative mystical experiences. The act of uh, saying, pronouncing these divine names with fire and spirit is a practice of raising energy within yourself uh, to be able to perform some kind of magical act. Uh, this is still found today um, and is a, an effective form of magic. Uh, we know through psychological research and stuff that strong states of emotion um, leave a really strong imprint on your mind and your memory for whatever is happening while you experience that strong state of emotion. This is how uh, trauma affects people negatively, but you can actually do this positively as well. So if you experience a really positive, strong emotion while doing a certain activity, uh, you're going to want to do that activity more. You know, um, if you yeah, do really well at something and you get a lot of praise for it, it makes you feel good, you want to do it again. Well, you can uh, artificially <laughs> create that, uh, that response in your body by raising yourself to a certain heightened emotional state and then specifically doing an intentional action in that state. Um, so this is still kind of on the fringe of science and spirituality, but it's a real way that, you know, manifesting or, or performing magic can actually be effective. And this is the way that I see all magic being effective, is that it reshapes our inner world to change the way that we behave, the way that we perceive the world, the way that we react. And so Magic doesn't work by changing something out there and making the world outside conform to us. It's not a way of artificially adjusting things outside of ourselves to be the way that we want them. That would be considered unethical to a lot of magicians and witches. Uh, anyways, but magic is more about reshaping us so that we're better uh, molded to uh, manifest and achieve the things uh, that we want. And that, as far as I see it, is absolutely effective. And so in that way, I think that uh, a lot of magic and witchcraft can be very powerful and beneficial uh, to people. And that's not the way that everyone sees magic. It's not the reason that everyone performs magic, um, but it is a huge part of it. Uh, so we'll uh, take a look at some more modern witchcraft uh, spells and practices so you can see more of what I'm talking about. But I do want to finish up going through this one first, just because it is so beautiful and interesting. Another quick note about the end of that last section. So I was talking about saying all these things with fire and spirit, raising yourself to an emotional level. He says that when you have done this, you will hear thundering and shaking in the surrounding realm, and you'll feel yourself being agitated. And then once you say silence at that point, 
you open your eyes and you will see the doors open and the world of the gods which is within the doors, so that from the pleasure and joy of the sight your spirit runs ahead and ascends. So this absolutely to me sounds like seeing the gates of heaven open, seeing the brilliant light of God coming through, or presence of God, and being lifted up spiritually and emotionally. It says your spirit will ascend. Um, that is the experience, the reaction to seeing the brilliance of the presence or the throne uh, of God. And so this is, uh, you know, very common way that this kind of mystical experience is described throughout human history. And he's just giving us specific instructions on what to do when inside that experience and how to continue it and uh, kind of finish it instead of just getting stuck at certain points along the way. After this, it says that you will have a vision of the god Helios. And it gives you an invocation with which to greet him. Once you have said that, it says that you will then see the seven fates of heaven will appear to you, and the seven gods who have the faces of black bulls in possession of seven golden diadems will appear to you, and it gives you greetings to pronounce to all of them. Now, when they take their place, the seven fates and the seven gods with the faces of bulls, here and there in order, Look in the air, and you will see lightning bolts going down, and lights flashing, and the earth shaking, and a god descending, a god immensely great, having a bright appearance, youthful golden hair, with a white tunic and a golden crown and trousers, holding in his right hand a golden shoulder of a young bull. This is the bear which moves and turns heaven around, moving upward and downward in accordance with the hour. Then you will see lightning bolts leaping from his eyes and stars from his body. So that's a very interesting description of a god, and it's definitely describing the god Mithras. If you uh, see any of the um, Mithraic kind of temples that exist all over uh, Europe and uh, kind of uh, the uh, Mesopotamia area, uh, they have these reliefs and uh, carvings and paintings and stuff of Mithras, and oftentimes he appears exactly as he's being described here. Uh, so that's very interesting. And it also makes some mention about the real deep secrets of the cult of Mithraism, when it uh, mentions uh, that in his right hand he will have a golden shoulder of a young bull, this is the bear which moves and turns heaven around. That's a very specific reference to an astronomical phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. And what's really interesting about the cult of Mithraism is that it seems that their god Mithras was the personification, anthropomorphized, uh, you know, form, deified form of the actual movement of the heavens that they saw uh, as the, the procession of the equinoxes. So they saw Mithras as this god that was so powerful that he reshaped the entire heavens around the earth. That's why Mithras was the greatest god, even more so than Helios, um, because he actually reshapes all of the stars uh, around us is how they saw it. And so they're giving you a clue as to the power of Mithras here um, when they talk about him being able to move and turn heaven around. And what's really interesting is that supposedly uh, procession of the equinoxes wasn't discovered until, uh, you know, after uh, this time period. But it seems that someone discovered it and created this mystery cult around that discovery by deifying uh, this astronom astronomical phenomenon. Um, and then it goes on to provide uh, another uh, description of what you will see uh, once you greet uh, Mithras with a specific greeting here. And it says, After you have said these things, he will immediately respond with a revelation. Now you will grow weak in soul, and you will not be in yourself when he answers you. 
He speaks the oracle to you in verse, and after speaking he will depart. But you remain silent, since you will be able to comprehend all these matters by yourself, for at a later time you will remember infallibly the things spoken by the great God, even if the oracle contained myriads of verses. So this is very interesting, because once again, this whole spell is for initiation, it's for the process of uh, granting immortality, which I mentioned is that a immortality is a revelation or a realization of your immortal nature. It's not something that's granted to you or given to you at a specific time. And he says here that Mithras will respond to this greeting with a revelation. And that revelation being the granting of immortality through the realization of your own immortal nature. After that, the spell provides some instructions on uh, how to perform the ritual correctly and how to create the mixture of the juices of herbs and spices that he spoke about at the beginning and what to do with that mixture. It actually says to write uh, these specific divine names on a leaf and then lick that off of the leaf at a specific time of day. Um, so very interesting stuff. I don't want to read all of those instructions, but just to give you an idea of what's going on. And then it ends uh, with instructions on how to make phylacteries that are involved in the ritual. And a very interesting quote. So I want to read this quote here uh, because it definitely has to do with the theme of gaining immortality. And I think that's why it's included here at the end. So this is what it says. It says, So speaking, he drove through the trench the single-hoofed horses and men gasping among grievous slaughters, and they washed off their profuse sweat in the sea. You will dare to lift up your mighty spear against Zeus. Zeus went up the mountain with a golden bullock and a silver dagger. Upon all he bestowed a share. Only to Amara he did not give, but he said, let go of what you have, and then you will receive. If you're interested in learning more about uh, the cult of Mithraism, uh, what they believed and how it was formed and the cultural context uh, in which they you know, operated and, and practiced, uh, you can check out my review uh, of the phenomenal book, The Origins of the Mithraic Mysteries, by author David Ulancey. Now I want to take a look at some modern spells and rituals, and that way we can compare them to the ancient ones we've discussed. We can uh, go over uh, commonalities and differences, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the beliefs and ethics and stuff of modern uh, witches and then we can uh, call it a day here. So I'm gonna open up a few modern spells. So I'm going to start off with a couple spells from this book here, uh, Spellcraft for a Magical Year um, by Sarah Bartlett. And this is just one of the books that I picked up when my partner and I were first interested in looking into this, um, just to see what some other uh, spells and rituals that you know people are doing um, in modernity are. And this book is really cool because it goes through the whole year and it talks about traditional celebrations and then it also provides um, specific uh, rituals and spells for certain times of the year. So this one is a full moon spell. And the reason I wanted to show this one as an example is that it um, draws on some ancient Greek influences. So I kind of want to show how uh, modern witches are definitely influenced and inspired by the kind of ancient uh, Greco-Roman Egyptian magic that we just discussed. And so this one does uh, reference the uh, Greek pantheon. So it references uh, Zeus and uh, Pandeus here. So uh, luckily, these modern spells are written in an easier-to-understand format as well. So I just want to read through what this new spell, or modern spell, is here for you, uh, so you can get an idea of what this is like. It says, Place and light the red candle 
a symbol of potency on the table, with the two stones on either side of the candle. The lapis lazuli is for hidden power, and the turquoise is for exploiting ideas. Sit quietly before the table or altar on the eve of the full moon. Begin to unravel the string from the ball until it is as long as your arm. Then cut the string, placing the length on the table, and say, By Pandya's power of moonlit night, come bring me all that is my right. And as this twine is cut each time, the luck of Zeus will be mine. Repeat the string cutting nine more times, Zeus's number, saying the above spell each time. When you have finished, say thank you, Zeus and Pandya, for helping me to have all that is due to me and for luck and stability in the future. Leave the threads on the table overnight, but don't forget to blow out the candle. In the morning, take the threads and wrap them in a silk scarf. Keep them in a safe place so that you are blessed with good luck and long-term happiness. Okay, so we can see some parallels right away from the ancient magic. Um, they are performing a uh, ritual act here. Uh, they're setting up a kind of altar, a uh, sacred space, and then they're performing this ritual act while repeating a prayer. Um, that's straight out of ancient magic. I mean, all those formulas, those invocations, conjurations, etc., those are all things that those people were saying as they were doing some kind of ritual act, right? And they're often uh, calling in uh, deities or praising deities of some kind while they're doing it. Uh, so this is no different. And then they're uh, leaving it out overnight, and then they're putting it away in a safe place. Uh, also similar to things we, we had seen in the ancient magic as well. Um, but you can see the materials used here are very different. So it gives you a little list, and these are the materials used. One red candle, one piece of lapis lazuli, one piece of turquoise, a ball of string, a pair of scissors, and a silk scarf. So we can see that what's happening is they're asking the modern witch to use items that are generally around or easy to obtain. Okay, so when I spoke about ancient magic, I talked about people using like animal body parts and herbs and things. It's because that stuff was readily available and easy for them to obtain. So today, people are using materials that are readily available to us today. And that's not parts of animals because we're not slaughtering animals for our own consumption, usually. So you can see there that there's a lot of similarities, a lot of parallels. This one's even referencing the same deities, but they're using different materials, and uh, otherwise it's pretty much exactly the same. So let's take a look at another one. One of the most common uh, types of spells that's found uh, throughout all of human history are uh, love spells, uh, spells to... Uh, uh, draw a lover to you, or find the right one for you, or something like that. Uh, these were extremely common in the ancient um, spells and magic. I didn't read any of those, um, but there are a lot of them in the PGM. So I do want to read a modern one for you. And it says at the top, if you are looking for new romance, then this spell should be cast just after the new moon to draw on the power of Selene, the moon goddess. Remember, in the PGM, Selene is referred to as just the goddess, but they're referring to Selene and or the moon. And so this is a new moon spell. This one says uh, you're going to need a cauldron, two pink candles, three drops each of the essential oils of rose, lavender, and jasmine, sandalwood incense, a wand or silver uh, colored spoon, and one piece of rose quartz. Interesting enough here, you'll see that they say to use rose oil, which is a very common ingredient in ancient Greco-Roman magic as well. So this is how you perform this new moon spell for romance. Place the cauldron or cooking pot on your altar between two lit pink candles. Gently drop the essential oils into the cauldron. 
Light the incense, and as you do, say, Selene, goddess of the moon, lady of enchanted light, let love be mine and soon. Next, tap the cauldron five times with your wand or silver spoon. Say one to seek him, slash her, two to find him, three to bring him, four to bind him. Heart to heart, forever one, so with five this spell is done. Tap the cauldron five more times. Place the wand or silver spoon beside the cauldron and extinguish the candle to speed the spell on its way. Every evening for two weeks, repeat the words of your spell. As you do so, tap your finger five times on the rose quartz love charm you're wearing or carrying. By the next new moon, your seductive charm will have drawn new romance to you. Okay, so once again, very interesting spell here. Uh, there's a couple uh, ritual actions you're doing. You're setting up a little altar and sacred space first, which we also saw in some of the ancient spells. If you remember, the Egyptian initiation spell tells you to create a little altar with a couple bricks and a fire on the bank of the Nile, and then to perform the spell within that sacred space. They're creating a different kind of sacred space here within which to perform their spell. They're referencing Selene. They are using uh, oils um, and uh, crystals and incense and candles. Once again, very common objects today, easily obtainable. Okay, they're repeating a uh, invocation while uh, lighting the incense, and then they're repeating a spell, a uh, magical formula, while tapping on the cauldron, and then they're repeating this every evening for two weeks, okay? So we saw some ancient spells that had people repeat things on a daily or a weekly basis or something as well. And once again, I want to point out that the way I see it is this magic isn't changing someone's mind out there and forcing them to fall in love with you. But what it's doing is it's um, placing more value on romance and on finding love within your own heart, within your own interior uh, mental space. And especially by repeating those words every day for two weeks, you're really going to solidify that intention within yourself. And then you're more likely to behave in ways to draw that to you. You're more likely to see opportunities um, for romance. And you're more likely to then uh, have the right words to say, etc. So some people think that all love spells are unethical because you're binding someone else to you or attempting to change someone else's feelings. Um, and there are certain spells that kind of are crafted in that way, but not this one. Um, it, I, didn't, I didn't see it that way anyways. You could maybe see the little um, poetry part as being something like that, but I, I don't see it that way. And I really do think that what it's really doing, if it's doing anything effective, is reshaping your own interior environment to be more likely to behave in ways to manifest what you desire because you're reinforcing what you value by repeating it, putting it into words, doing actions while you're saying it, having certain incenses or oils or something around that you're experiencing while you're saying these words also has the effect of giving it like a deeper imprint on your mind, especially when you involve the sense of smell, which is why incense and essential oils are such a big part of witchcraft. Uh, once again, I think the ancient people were a lot more clever than we give them credit for, and they knew the power of scent and smell on memory and on um, reshaping our, our mind and our hearts. One of the other most common kinds of spells you'll find, both ancient and modern, are money spells, um, spells to acquire money of some kind. Uh, so for this one, I'm going to turn to this book here, The Spellbook for New Witches by Ambrosia Hawthorne. Um, and this one just has a whole bunch of spells, all kinds of stuff if you want to um, learn about different kinds of spells. It's a really cool book uh, to look into. And this one is a nine-day money candle spell. 
and it says at the top, sometimes money spells require extra time to weave together their magic. This is a simple candle spell that works over a longer period of time. Dedicate 15 minutes every day for nine days to allow this spell's power to grow slowly. So this is uh, what I was just talking about. Uh, repeating these intentions that you want to make more money uh, for 15 minutes every day for nine days is really going to solidify that intention and increase that value, uh, increase you, the, the amount that you value uh, earning money. So I do think that uh, modern witches as well are on to something here with how to actually reshape our inner environment. And they do it through these really interesting spells and rituals. So let's take a look here at what this spell entails. So it gives you a list of ingredients again at the top. Super nice in these modern spell books. It says you're going to need a green pillar candle, a white pillar candle. Two tablespoons of carrier oil, such as olive oil, six drops of bergamot essential oil, one tablespoon dried basil or mint, and a lighter or matches. And you're going to perform the spell during a waning moon or new moon. First, it says to cleanse your altar and purify the candles. So you're setting up a sacred space. Mix the carrier oil with the bergamot essential oil focusing on your intentions to bring yourself wealth and abundance. So this spell doesn't have you say something while you do this, but it has you focus on the intentions in your mind and in your heart. Then place the candles about nine inches apart on the altar. The white candle represents you. The green candle represents the money you are attracting. Anoint your green money candle by rubbing the oil blend down the candle with your fingers. Start at the top of the candle and work downward to enhance attracting energy. Do not get oil on the wick. Sprinkle the basil or mint on the green money candle to power it. Light the two candles and close your eyes. Meditate for 15 minutes on your intentions. And then say, candle of capital, come to me, mint of money, weave and oversee. Today I will it, so mote it be. Day one is now complete. Repeat the spell for eight more days. Every day, bring the green candle an inch closer to the white candle and sprinkle it with basil or mint. After nine days, they will unite. Okay, so we can see they're setting up a sacred space. They are using uh, oils and candles and dried herbs. Very easily obtainable. Uh, ingredients and ingredients that have really strong uh, scent, smell, right? The bergamot oil and then the dried and burning uh, basil or mint. It's going to have a lot of uh, sensations coming off of that. And it's also very visual and you're repeating this, yeah, for nine days in a row. So this is going to have a deep effect on your inner life as well. So one more modern spell before I recap with some philosophy and uh, ethics and beliefs. And this is a spell that I actually have performed myself with my partner uh, several times now. And this is a home protection spell. So this one says, protection begins at home. Use this protection wash to shield and fortify your home from malevolent spirits, unwanted attention, and other harm. You should make a fresh protection watch at the beginning of each new season to ensure its potency. Ingredients you will need is one quart of water, a large pot, a bucket, a cup of white vinegar, 12 drops of bergamot oil, and 12 drops of geranium oil. And you should perform this on a Saturday or during a dark moon. It says, cleanse your kitchen space. Bring a large or boil a large pot of water to remove any impurities. Pour the purified water into a clean bucket. Add the white vinegar to the bucket. Focus on your intentions and pour in the bergamot and geranium essential oils. Stir the bucket three times and say, thrice around the bucket round, protect the walls and the ground. Use this spelled wash to clean the windows and doors in your home. Okay. 
pretty straightforward, very similar to the other one, except the intention is for protection this time. And you actually uh, put that wash on your windows and doors around the exterior of your home to protect your space and everything inside of it. All right, so I just showed you four examples from ancient witchcraft and four examples from modern witchcraft so that you can see what people are actually doing when they say they're a witch or they're practicing witchcraft or casting a spell um, to dispel the prejudice. So what are the common misconceptions about witchcraft? Let's take a look at what they actually believe and discuss some of those misconceptions and misunderstandings and then we can wrap up the video. So starting with the biggest misunderstanding uh, about witches and witchcraft, I'm going to go back to the idea uh, that spawned the witch trials and a lot of the Inquisition, and that's that supposedly these witches were accused of being in league with Satan, with the devil to corrupt the morality of the populace and uh, bring down uh, the authority of the Christian church, or something like that. It was believed that there was some huge conspiracy, witches were flying off in the night to meet with Satan and come back and do his bidding. It's very interesting since the vast majority of these women were devout Christians. But never mind that. Today, this prejudice and misunderstanding continues. You don't have to look very far back to see evidence of this. Uh, you can see the QAnon phenomenon, this is continuing on, or the satanic panic um, back from what, the 80s or 90s. Uh, so th this is still something that lingers around today, and even I've had personal experiences with people I know who have um, repeated this to me very recently. So I want to take a quote here from this book, um, called Solitary Witch by Silver Ravenwolf. And this one's a little older. Um, it's from the time period when, uh, before witchcraft uh, gained popularity more recently, when it was mostly uh, Wiccans who were practicing witchcraft. And so this book is uh, kind of explicitly Wiccan, although it talks about witchcraft more broadly as well. Uh, so I just want to read some quotes from here so that you can see what they actually believe, how they feel about Satan and Christianity. And uh, it may surprise you. So here's what this author had to say. It says, Up until this point, you have may have noticed that I haven't talked about Satan at all. That's because witches don't believe in him. He belongs in the Christian pantheon, and he can stay there. Which is why most witches don't use the Christian pantheon. Now, once again, this is a very specific time period in history where witches didn't use the Christian pantheon. If you go back a hundred years or more, that's not going to be the case. It says, witches believe that to give evil a name is to create that evil. Why bother to do that? Humans manage to manufacture enough evil in the world on their own without slapping it on the shoulders of a mythical beastie. Okay, so... That's one person's opinion about Satan. You can see there they certainly don't worship him. They don't even believe that Satan exists. And they, they there's nothing satanic about witchcraft. You just saw eight examples of spells. They referenced Jesus. They referenced Zeus and other uh, deities. But none of them referenced Satan or demons or anything like that, except for the one that was for casting out demons using the name of Jesus. So, here, this next section talks about what deities witches choose to work with. And it says that, you know, most witches at that time, once again, don't work with the Christian pantheon. And they were asked why. It says there's more than one answer to this question. And I think it partially depends on who you are talking to, their personality, their educational background, and the experiences they have had in other religious structures. The pantheons, as most of us work with them today, do not single out evil by giving it a name and a personality. Each god and goddess has their own personality, and that personality, they have a dark side and a light side. 
order and chaos, animal and spiritual, just like people. That's why we study their legends. How you use this energy is extremely important. In the Christian pantheon, the dark side is given individual power through the idea of Satan and his many demons. Some magical people feel that by separating this darkness and allowing it to stand on its own, the Christian religion weakened their own pantheon, leaving the door wide open for a person to rationalize away his or her own responsibility to themselves and to the world. So you can see here that uh, witches, especially in modernity, have a really strong sense of ethics, and they would find any kind of uh, concept of consorting with Satan or evil or demons or anything like that completely unethical and would never even consider such a thing. They actually seem to have a stronger sense of ethics than most religious people I have met, and they tend to be more welcoming and more generous as well. I have personal experience with this myself. So there's some more interesting information in here. Um, this is a really long book, so I'm not going to quote any uh, longer sections, but I just wanted to uh, read one more uh, little section here about why Christian or why a lot of witches don't work with the Christian pantheon. It says another reason is the absence of male-female balance. Christianity is a patriarchal religion, or male-dominated faith, and many women and men find this e idea equally offensive. I certainly do. Although some Wiccans learn to plug in female divinity somewhere in the Christian pantheon, relying on old information from Gnostic texts and other areas, the system itself and many of its current practitioners continue to view the presence of women as something that must be tolerated, not celebrated, and certainly within the system as it stands now, the female principle will never be elevated to equal divine status. And I think they're correct in that, uh, you know, analysis of the state of Christianity and in its weaknesses. I, I think it is too patriarchal. I think it is too dogmatic. And I think that it doesn't deal with the question of evil in a way that's very helpful. For human beings. So I agree with most of those criticisms. I personally am a Christian, and I do reference Jesus and the Christian pantheon. Um, but there are definitely ways to do that and still be a practicing magician or witch. In fact, throughout all of medieval European history, you know, during the witch trials and the Inquisition, etc., once again, most of the people who were practicing magic and witchcraft throughout all of that time were devout Christians. They did not see themselves as a witch or a magician or anything like that. Typically, they would have self-identified as a Christian. They would go to church every Sunday. They would have acted like every other Christian, and they would have prayed like every other Christian, etc. Um, they just had a couple other... Uh, practices that they did that were traditional, they probably learned uh, from their mother, grandmother, etc., and that singled them out for persecution. Interesting things I learned when I started to look into magic and witchcraft is that uh, it's a lot, um, let's see, more mundane and, and boring for the most part than most people would ever believe or imagine. Uh, the vast majority of magic and witchcraft comes down to prayer and meditation, and then sometimes some ritual actions. But really, it focuses around prayer and meditation. When you go to apply for initiation to any kind of uh, magical order, they give you instructions on a meditation practice to pick up and to journal and document for anywhere between 30 to 90 days before you even can apply for initiation today. Uh, in ancient times, it might have been even longer. Sometimes people had to go through years of study and practice to be initiated. Um, and, you know, which is uh, all, all of the spells we've covered here, they're all full of prayers. And so one of the questions that witches often get asked is, do you pray? And people can't seem to wrap their heads around this. So I just want to read this answer here once again from this book by Silver Ravenwolf. And it says here, I'm quoting, One of the questions I am asked most by interviewers is, do witches pray? Of course they do. 
and when I answer, yes, absolutely, they look at me as if I have gone crazy. This is because the interview is equating prayer as only belonging to the religion that they are most familiar with. Granted, witches are more focused than most people about prayer. We concentrate on the purity of the area and the purity of the mind before we begin to pray. Indeed, most spell casting activities are nothing more than focused prayer with tools conducted in sacred space. Like other religions, this is talking about Wicca specifically, we have prayers and rituals of adoration, devotional prayers, prayers for holidays, and prayers for when we are sad. We have prayers in which we are asking for help and prayers of thanks. So, you can see there, they do a lot of praying. And uh, it's not just Wiccan witches, it's, it's pretty much all witches. I mean, you saw the spells, you can see what she had to say about it. It's really interesting to me that people can't wrap their head around this uh, fact that, you know, your neighbor could be a witch and you'd have no idea. Uh, you know, I am a practicing witch. Most people don't understand that or what that means. But what it means to me is that I've been really inspired by these people, by their efforts at purifying their space and purifying their mind before they can begin to pray, I think that's a really worthwhile activity, and I think it dramatically uh, increases the effectiveness or the power uh, of prayer. Once again, not to convince God or something outside of yourself to conform the world to your will, but to reshape yourself. That's what, what prayer is really for. Uh, it's for attunement of yourself. And once again, you attune your inner self, and that attracts what you desire to you if you're aligned internally. So I think that religious people could learn a lot from doing some witchcraft and talking to some witches about how serious they take prayer. But beyond that, there are some other really um, helpful and beneficial core values in witchcraft. And so I want to turn back to one of the other books here, uh, to discuss what they call the core principles. So it says the core principles of witchcraft relate to how we use energy to manifest change in our environment. Magic is all around us in the form of energy. Practicing spells helps us learn to direct our intentions to manipulate energy. And then it says the core principles are uh, worshiping the environment and nature. Uh, so uh, most witches uh, celebrate natural cycles, uh, like the lunar and solar cycles, the seasons, etc. The next core principle is celebrating fertility and sexuality. So celebrating life, light, joy, passion, and sensuality ignites the life force within us all. Embracing your fertility and sexuality can be a valuable tool to manifest magic. Next core principle is tapping into intuition and personal energy. Then honoring the natural balance of cosmic law. This is a very standard belief in witchcraft, and it says this is the law of threefold return. It's an old pagan adage used to caution new witches about the consequences of performing harmful magic. If you cause harm or perform manipulative magic on another, you will receive the same back threefold. This is known as the cosmic law. Next core principle and last one here is knowing and understanding the afterlife, spirits, and or reincarnation. Now, not all witches believe in reincarnation. Many do. Um, many people do. Uh, and a lot of witchcraft does reference spirits in the afterlife, but not all. So those are some of the main themes you'll find in witchcraft. And uh, a lot of those are really simple, uh, basic thing. I mean, caring for the environment, celebrating your sexuality, tapping into your intuition, um, you know, acknowledging the cosmic law of, of ethics, and uh, yeah. Learning about the afterlife. Pretty deep stuff. Nothing satanic there. So let's take a look at one more. And see what it says here. 
Okay. So this is back from the Spellcraft for a Magical Year. And this is a section called How to Be a Good Witch. Spell work first begins with your own moral responsibility when performing magic. How you perform any magic spell or enchantment, or when you perform any magic spell or enchantment, you must be honest with yourself and accept that you're doing it not only for the good of yourself, but also for everyone else. What goes around comes around according to the law of witchcraft. And ill intentions sent out may be visited upon you, usually threefold. So remember, never cast spells in a moment's impulse, in anger, or to hurt or upset others. Each time you cast a spell, think about your motives. Are they with goodwill, with no intentions of hurting anyone else? Okay, so there you got to see a little bit of the ethics of witchcraft. So if you're worried about witches out there casting curses and hexes and trying to manipulate people with spells, it's just not happening. I, I don't know of anyone who does that. I've never heard of anyone doing that. There might be a few, I don't know, confused uh, teenagers who are trying to do that kind of thing, but they do all kinds of stupid stuff. So that's the least of our worries, I think. Uh, as I see it, they have a stronger stance on morals and ethics than, once again, most religious people, certainly most secular people. There's a really strong uh, emphasis placed on your intentions. And you'll see this ubiquitously, uh, because your inner world, your heart and your head, have to be aligned with the actions you're performing. It's not just performing mindless ritual actions. Real magic and witchcraft comes from the alignment of your head and heart and your body in a clean, purified space with a clean, purified mind with directed energy and emotions. Science is coming around to uh, quantifying how all of those things can be effective in producing internal change. Witches have just simply been doing this for thousands of years because they knew it worked. They might not have known why. They might not have understood the psychoactive effects of the vocalizations, uh, the, vocalizations the breath work, the aromas, the incenses, the oils, etc. They all have those effects, uh, whether or not people were conscious of it. And I think it's clear now that there's nothing evil, there's nothing satanic about it. It's a ancient method for uh, personal development. That's how I see it. Now, other people will disagree with me. There are a lot of people who firmly believe in the uh, literal, you know, actual existence of spirits and deities and so on, and they believe that when you pray to them, they actually you know, listen to you and change things in the world around you. That's certainly the way that most you know, Christians believe. Uh, I'm not sure if I agree with that or not, but we don't need to. Uh, we can see it as being effective and powerful without any spirits or deities or angels or demons or anything like that getting involved. Well, I hope you learned something today about witchcraft, about witches, what they believe, how they practice. Uh, what ancient witchcraft was like, and how modern witchcraft traditions are continuing that, but slightly modifying it for a mod modern audience. And I hope you are more uh, gracious and open-minded to any witches you may come into contact with in the future. I certainly hope that we do not repeat uh, the horrific uh, injustices of the Inquisition, of the witch trials, of the Satanic Panic, and QAnon. So I think this is an important topic to discuss, and I hope you have learned something from this video that will change the way you approach it in the future. Now, if you're interested in learning more and maybe starting a practice, there's one more book I just want to point you to real fast, and I know I've referred to so many in this video. I'll have links to all of them in the description below. But this one is what I think the is the best book for a brand new person who's just looking into learning magic and witchcraft. 
they don't have any experience, and they want to learn how to perform magic effectively. The best book I know of is this one right here called Psychic Witch by Matt Oren. Here's the, so you can see his name there, spelled a little strangely. Um, this is an absolutely incredible book, and it just walks you through step by step of how to tap into your intuition, how to manipulate your own energy, how to meditate, how to do different visualization practices, etc. It gives you all of the foundation you need to be effective in your spell casting because the real power, remember, is inside you. Okay, so if you want to learn more, I highly recommend that one as a starting point. The other books that I've referred to are all great as well. If you want to learn more about ancient magic, the PGM is a really, really interesting collection. I sometimes just open it up to a random page and just start reading because it's just so fascinating. And there's some really interesting stuff in there. I'm sure I'm going to pull it out in quite a few future videos. Well, thank you all for joining me today. I know this one was a little bit long, uh, but I, there's a lot of interesting stuff here that I wanted to cover. And I wanted to give you a good number of actual examples of spells and rituals so that you can just learn for yourself what witchcraft actually is. If you enjoyed this video and you're not a subscriber, please hit subscribe, hit the like button, maybe leave me a comment. And check out my books as well, Foundations and Luna, if you want to learn more about how to build uh, the practices and beliefs and uh, everything and how to perform rituals uh, like the ones I described here. Specifically, my book Luna will guide you through a series of lunar rituals that are very much uh, inspired by and would fit within the umbrella of witchcraft. Foundations is a little more cognitive. It's kind of more like the stuff you'll see in Psy Psychic Witch to um, build up the interior uh, mental space and skills and stuff you need to perform uh, magic and to avoid self-deception, things like that, to purify your mind. So check that out. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you again soon.